Thursday already. So yeah, hello, happy Thursday. I have a lot of questions to answer from you guys and tonight, which I will try to get to all of them. And one thing that's exciting is we're working on making all these live sessions into podcasts. So those should be ready in the next couple of weeks where you can watch replays of these Q&A sessions as a podcast, which is awesome. I love listening to podcasts because I do it while I'm driving and I learn a lot. So hello, Tiffany. I see you're watching there. A couple of things on the agenda tonight. Uh, I have a few webinars coming up. So I can't believe how fast time goes. I can't believe that it's already the middle of December. It feels like the weeks are just going by so fast. So Christmas is al already coming up next week. And I'm going to be doing two live webinars in January. So I'm going to be doing one on January 1st for goal setting. And then I'm also going to be doing another live webinar the following Sunday. So that is going to be so I have two webinars coming up in January. Uh, the groundwork course, I've been working a lot on it and I really love doing groundwork. I think, so I started out riding dressage and then I had a really difficult problem horse that had a rearing problem. And so we went to a Western cow, cowboy trainer and we did a lot of groundwork with him and, you know, taught him how to release and bend and drop his neck. And so that's kind of the beginning of my groundwork journey is going back to the Western world. I learned how to start young horses and particularly when you're starting young horses, you want to do a lot of groundwork with them before you get on them. And then now, as I've gotten back into dressage, you can actually teach a lot of the dressage moves from the ground. So all of my horses, I teach them leg yields and turn on the forehands and pee off passage, all of that I teach from the ground first. So groundwork is a really useful tool. It's something that you need to know to stay safe and also just to have a good relationship with your horse, basically. Most of the time that we spend with our horses is on the ground. And so we want our horse to be respectful to us. Um, yes, yeah, Cindy's asking, is that rain or wind? So it is raining. <laughs> it's been like kind of a crazy week. I live in Southern California and so our winters are really mild. So I shouldn't even be complaining because I know a lot of you guys are like living in places where it's freezing cold and snowing. So I should not be complaining about rain, but we've been getting a lot of rain lately. And the way my barn is set up, we have five arenas and there's five trainers at my barn. But the arenas do not do well in the rain. So when it rains, it takes like several like probably a week. It takes like five days for the ring to dry out to where you can ride in it again. So we have these giant tarps that we put over the arenas, but we only have tarps for two arenas. So when the rain is coming, we get all the trainers and all the grooms, we get like 20 people out there and we cover the arenas. And then when it stops raining, Everyone has to gather at a set time and we pull the tarps off of the arena so that we can ride pretty much the second that it stops raining. Now, the problem is that today it started raining again, which wasn't in the forecast. And so we only put the tarp back on one of the arenas. So I'm like praying that the lower arena, which is where we were riding today, that's like the bigger arena. I'm praying that it didn't get saturated with rain. Otherwise, it will not be fun. We won't have anywhere to ride. So that's kind of what we deal with here in Southern California. Let's see. Where do you guys live? Oh, Lori lives in Vancouver. Lots of rain. Um, Claudia lives in the tropics. So yeah, I think that the winter is always a little bit of a challenging time with horses and it's hard to balance, you know, like keeping them going, but then when they have to have some time off, they get really fresh and you have to start over again. 
So yeah, groundwork is always a really good skill to have when your horse is crazy and has been locked up. Okay, what other things? Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about the video that I posted on YouTube this week. If you haven't watched it yet, I posted a video of me helping my assistant, Kane, on an off the track thoroughbred. And I've gotten a lot of feedback. I know a lot of you guys really appreciated kind of more of a real life video with a horse that, you know, he's he's a really good horse and he showed some difficulties and also a lot of improvement in the video. So that was really fun. Kane has been working for me for several years now. She is usually the one behind the camera. So she does a lot of the film work for me. And she also takes a lot of my photos. So thank you, Kane. If you're watching this, she's really a wonderful person and an important part of my team, which as I continue to grow, I have a big support team behind me. And I'm very grateful for that. So Kane helps me with some writing and teaching and does a lot of the camera work. Uh, my husband, of course, is amazing. He helped me like all day today just with some teaching. And he also helps just manage everything. So that's really nice. I'm looking for a groom. So if any of you guys are interested, I need a full-time groom. And then I have a few people also that help me like with the online stuff. So with Instagram and Facebook, and of course, my mother, Joellen. So I have a big team and I'm so grateful to everyone that supports everything that we do. So we can continue to bring you guys awesome content. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the club. So Amelia's Dressage Club on Facebook. I don't spend a lot of time on there, but I have to say that whenever I go on the club, I'm so impressed and so grateful to all of you guys because it's such a wonderful community and everyone is so supportive of one another. It's like, it's amazing. It just gives me chills when I see someone on the club ask a question and there'll be like 40 comments that are just so helpful and great ideas and great feedback. And it's amazing. It's really a wonderful place. When I started the group on Facebook, I was skeptical of what it would become but it's really, it's just incredible. And I'm so grateful to how willing all of you guys are to share and to help one another. And part of why that's important is because in helping someone else, in teaching someone else, in giving them a suggestion, you learn it better. So that's really, when you can teach it or when you can explain it to someone else, then you understand it and learn it even better. So not only are you helping someone else when you answer their question, but you're also helping yourself. And that's really the beauty of the community that we have online is that we help one another. So that's awesome. Last weekend, I did a clinic in Northern California. I really love doing clinics. I don't like traveling. I don't like leaving my horses and my dog and my husband, but I really enjoy seeing new people working with new horses. And at the clinic last weekend, there was a family, they had five girls and I taught four of the girls and it was really fun. I really love teaching kids and they were so cool. Those kids, they, helped each other and they were, you know, leading each other around on their horses and they knew how to lunge their horses. And they were also responsible for taking care of their horses and feeding their horses and blanketing their horses. So I told the mother, I was like, you are doing such a good job with those girls. And yeah, it was fun to teach them. When I go to clinics, it's always... You know, whenever you get a new horse and rider, it takes a little feeling out to figure out, you know, what works for the horse, what works for the rider, and just that everyone can, you know, relax and have a productive lesson. 
but I've ridden so many horses and I've worked with so many riders that I'm pretty good at assessing, you know, where they're at and then being able to come up with exercises to help them pretty quickly. I also think it's important when I see that an exercise or something isn't working for a rider then I always change the exercise or go back to something more basic. And I think that that's really important when you're riding alone, but also, you know, when I come in to do a clinic that I don't want to overface someone. I also really enjoy working with horses and riders of all levels. So the clinic last weekend, there were some more beginner riders that like I had one lady that had only been riding for a year and she was doing really well with her horse. She was walk track canner and she tried really hard. And so that's fun for me. I love working with beginner riders and I also really love working with the FEI riders. And I had a few riders that were, you know, kind of schooling the Grand Prix movements and that's really fun as well. So it's, it's just fun to be able to see a new person and a new horse and then communicate to them and see them change. And so that was really fun. Okay, so what else? We have a ton of questions. Um, Let me know in the chat if you guys want what your Christmas plans are. It's already next Saturday is Christmas or what your holiday plans are. We have some, I think we're doing the 12 days of Christmas. And so we're going to be like doing a repost of kind of a new video every day, just through the holiday season, and then leading up to the webinar that we have on the first. So that's the holiday plan for our online stuff. I'm going to be staying home and riding my horses, spending time with my horses. That's always my most favorite thing to do. All right, let me get to your questions. Uh, Daniela, when you're breaking a horse and getting it used to trotting and cantering, do you let it hold its own body or how do you request it to use itself more correctly and less hollow? I'm talking the first rides to a few months down the line. Okay. So when I start a young horse at first, I just kind of want to let them figure out their balance and I don't really worry about them being round or on the bit until they're kind of just understanding to go forward and walk, trot, canter. But I always, before I start a young horse, I always teach them to bend and like yield their hindquarters because you need, you need to be able to have some control when you get on. So you need to be able to bend and push your horse off the inside leg so that you can turn and stop your horse if things go badly. So then after that, uh, I usually start kind of teaching my horse to take a frame from the ground. So pretty much anything that I do in training, I try to introduce it first from the ground. So I start kind of trying to teach the horse to go on the bit and yield from the ground. And then I introduce that under saddle. And those are kind of like, it's hard to explain, but that's a lot of what I'm going to show in the grounder course is those steps, like how you teach your horse to bend, how you teach your horse to go on the contact, how you teach your horse to accept the connection, all of that stuff from the ground. And if you teach it from the ground first, it's a lot easier um, when you're under saddle. Okay. Let me see. Claudia has a question, which I'll answer. My mare is having a hard time with the walk canter transition. She just runs in her trot. What would you recommend? I recently purchased her. She's a 12-year-old Dutch-English mix. Um, Okay, so for the walk canner transition, you need collection, right? The walk canner transition is a collecting exercise. So I would recommend going back to your trot canner transition and try to get where you can really go from a slow trot into the canner so that you don't allow her to run to the canner into the canner that's what i would start with and then what i would do is i would build up where you go walk 
and then a few steps trot and then canter. But I would not allow her to run into the canter if you feel that she is ready for that. You need to teach her to keep the little more weight behind and then pick up the canter. Okay, um, Lori, when is it time to put a horse in a double bridle? This is a good question. I feel like it's time to put a horse in the double bridle, usually when they're like second, third level, and you feel like they are pretty good in the in the snaffle bridle. That's usually when I introduce the double bridle. For example, with my horse Kensington, he's six, coming seven, and he's pretty, he's like third level. He's pretty, he's quite good in the snaffle. I've ridden him in the double bridle some. So like I put Kensington in the double bridle for, I would say, you know, two or three days. And then when he was six, and then I felt like he was kind of opening his mouth a little too much in the double. So then I put him back in the snaffle and I tried to get a little more self carriage in the snaffle. Then I put him back in the double. So you need to switch off between the snaffle and the double bridle. You don't want to just switch to the double and never go back to the snaffle because they complement each other. So you want to switch back and forth. But often the double bridle can help because it can help to get your horse a little lighter, a little softer, and a little more up and flexed at the pole. Okay, Nicole, I started to learn how to ride and I have a problem with my feet going way into the stirrups when trotting. The stirrups end up at my heels. <laughs> um, let's see. She has trouble keeping her heels down. My instructors say just keep telling me to put my heels down, but it's impossible. Um, okay, so for those of you guys, I think this is a common problem that a lot of you guys lose your stirrups and your stirrups end up sliding back into the arch of your foot. So when you ride, you really want to keep your stirrup on the ball of your foot. That's an important part of your position. So the first thing to start with is make sure that your stirrups are the correct length. The way that you know your stirrup is the correct length, if you take your feet out of the stirrup, the bottom of the stirrup should be even with the ball of your heel. So that's how you know whether or not your stirrup is the correct length. Um, Candy says here, think about lifting your toes. So sometimes, yeah, that really helps. If you think about rather than pushing your heel down, think about lifting your toe. And then when you pick up the trot, so I would recommend like feel the ball of your feet on the stirrup at the walk, pick up the trot, and then try to keep that same feeling. Like you need to feel the pressure of the stirrup on the ball of your foot. Sometimes you start gripping and then when you draw your leg up, then the stirrup falls back because you no longer have pressure in your stirrup. So you have to have a little bit of pressure in your stirrups to keep that. The other thing, I have one student who her calves get like really tight and so she can't physically push her heels down. So if that's you, then you need to stretch your calves before you ride. Okay. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Donna says she did the snowman today and both circles were about the same size. Good for you, Donna. Claudia, can you repeat about stirrup length? Okay. So yes, when the way that you know whether your stirrups are the correct length, you take your feet out of the stirrups, you let your legs hang long and the bulb of your ankle, like your ankle bone that sticks out to the side, that should be level with the bottom of your stirrup. So basically, when you take your feet out of the stirrup, your leg should be a little longer. So you should have to lift your toe a little bit to find the stirrup. Okay, Donna, can I say the aid for the canter depart? <laughs> okay, you guys have a lot of questions tonight. So the, the universal aid for the canter depart is inside leg at the girth, outside leg behind the girth, and a little bit 
inside seat bone. That's the universal aid. Every horse and every rider vary that a little bit. So for me personally, I use a little more outside leg to ask for the canner. Like when I'm actually asking for the canner, I put a little more pressure in my outside leg behind the girth. Some people use a little more inside leg in the canter depart. So the inside leg, which creates impulsion and um, getting the horse to step under themselves. It's always important whenever you ask for the canter that your horse is positioned one way or the other so that you have an idea if you're asking for right lead canter, you want your horse to be just a little flex to the right, a little position to the right so that they know which lead you want. And then you also have to feel the balance. So some horses require kind of a stronger half halt than others for the canter transition. Uh, okay. So Lisa says, any tips for learning how to feel which lead you have? Um, so it can be hard at first to know which lead you're on. A good way to tell is say you pick up the canner and you're going straight and you think you're on the left lead canner, try turning to the left. If your horse is able to balance and make the turn to the left, then you're probably on the left lead canner. If you go to turn left and it starts to feel really wonky and the horse kind of breaks to the trot or loses their balance, then you're probably on the right lead canner. Like anything, if you have eyes on the ground, if you have an instructor that can tell you, yes, okay, that's the left lead canner, or no, that's the right lead canner, that's the best way, but it just takes time and it takes practice. Okay, Cindy, I would love to be clarified on proper leg position when doing the leg yields. At the girth. Um, or do you bring your leg a little behind the girth? So correct leg position for the leg yield is that technically your inside leg should be at the girth. And sometimes, yes, when you're first starting to teach the leg yield, you might need to bring your leg a little bit back or... If you have a smaller horse and your legs are long, sometimes you need to bring your inside leg a little back just to get that first answer. When you do a leg yield, the horse does not have bend in their body. So shoulder in, half pass, haunches in, the horse is bending from their pull to their tail. When you're doing a leg yield, your horse should be straight from their pull to their tail. So more or less, your legs should be even. Like if I was to look down from above, my left leg and my right leg would be even on the horse, although you have more pressure with the inside leg. Hopefully that answers your question, Cindy. So for a leg yield, you don't have bend, but you just have a slight flexion to the inside. Um, okay, let's see. You guys have a lot of questions. Um, can't, someone's asking, can you just look and see the canter lead? So yeah, you can sometimes if you look down at your horse's shoulders, I guess you could see that in, you want to see the inside front leg, the, whichever lead you're on that inside front leg is going to look like it's moving more forward. I've always, I've never really had luck with being able to look for the canter lead, but maybe that works for some people. Uh, okay, this is a good question from Jenny. How does the universal canter depart cue, inside leg at the girth, outside leg back, inside seat bone, differ from the haunches in cue? Okay, this is a good question, and it's a hard one because... You're right, Jenny, that the aid for canter and the aid for haunches in are very similar. And sometimes horses do get confused about it. The difference I would say is that I would say if I want to pick up the canter, it's more of a distinct aid. It's more like I'm like trot, 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 canter. 
So it's more of a distinct aid to make the gait change. And then I also, when I ask for the gait change, my hips change with it. As opposed to if I'm asking for haunches in, I'm a little bit more blending into the movement. So I'm kind of thinking about um, blending my trot into haunches in. The other thing is that when you ask for the canter, you don't want your horse to put their haunches in. So you need a little bit more inside leg so that when you ask for the canter, that you direct the horse's energy forward, as opposed to in haunches in, the energy is still flowing forward, but I would say your outside leg is a little more dominant. So like if I'm, say I'm trotting and I ask for canter and instead my horse puts the haunches in, I right away am pushing them off the inside leg and into the outside rein again. So, but it is, it is similar, those two aids. And so you have to be really clear in your mind what you're asking for and that there's a, a bit of a difference, whatever that might be. And that's the hard part of dressage is that it does become a very refined communication as you move up the levels. And that's why, you know, when you have a Grand Prix horse, they're really finely tuned and it's not always so easy for someone to hop on and feel those buttons. So, you know, like Harvey, for example, he's super sensitive and he's not a horse that I would just put anyone on because he's so fine tuned that, you know, when I go out of town, it's almost better for him to just not get ridden than for someone to get on and like try to find his buttons because they just it gets complicated as you move up the levels, but, but yeah, clear intention. And then um, just a clear correction. If your horse canters and you want haunches in say, no, come back to the trot. This is what I want. When your horse does the right thing, always remember to reward your horse. Okay. Let's see. Cheryl here on YouTube. I have Facebook and YouTube going at the same time. So Cheryl on YouTube is asking, when doing a shoulder in, haunches in, Ron Vare, do you sit in the direction of the movement or the inside seat bone? So you always, for shoulder in, haunches in, Ron Vare, you always sit on your inside seat bone because you always want to be sitting over your horse's center of gravity. So hopefully that helps you, Cheryl. All right, what else? We're not going to get to all of these questions tonight. So let me see. Is a half halt balancing the shoulders or gathering the energy or both? What are the aids or difference in both? Okay, so I think of a half halt. Half halt is really about gathering the energy so that you can do something with it. And uh, we just did a whole workshop on half halts. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to publish that lecture because half halts are complicated, and there's both a mental and a physical aspect to half halts. So, for a young horse, I think of a half halt as just getting your horse's attention, like just that you kind of see that inside ear tip back, and that your horse is listening to you like a half halt's like hey heads up pay attention something's gonna happen that's the mental aspect of a half halt physically a half halt is a little bit rebalancing your horse so a half halt is kind of balancing the energy back to the hindquarters so that you can do something useful with it like i said with everything in dressage Half halts are very unique to the horse and to the situation. So it takes a lot of practice and messing around with it to figure out the right half halt for your horse. And it might be different in every day, in every moment, and in every time. So good. Okay, that was, we had a lot of questions tonight. Um, for those of you guys that are members of the Academy, don't forget, we have a lecture this Sunday on suppleness and straightness. 
I did a lecture last night on suppleness on straightness. I'm doing it again on Sunday. So if you weren't able to come on Wednesday, be sure to come on Sunday. Also on Sunday, if you are part of the rider position masterclass, I'm doing a Q&A on Sunday with Stephanie. So be sure to watch that. And yeah, sign up for the webinars coming up next month. We have just a lot going on. So I hope that you guys all have a wonderful evening. I hope that we get through this next week or so. I'm really looking forward to the days when they start getting longer. I think the winter solstice is coming up soon. I think it's like already next week. And then the days will start getting longer. The sun will be coming back. So I'm always really grateful when we get to the shortest day of the year and then the days start getting longer again because I don't like it when it's dark. And that's it. So I'm going to go have some dinner. And thank you all for being here with me. Thank you all for being part of this community and sharing our love and appreciation for horses and for riding because they really are amazing creatures. And uh, we're all blessed to have them in our life. So good night, everyone.